Let's get corrupted. What's up, YouTube? It's your boy Joe with Meteoric Serpents coming back at you for another episode of the Colubrid Corruption Podcast. Guys, happy Sunday. Hope you're all having a great weekend. I'm back here with another episode and super stoked to be here. Tonight, we are having on Jessica from Hair Hollow Farm. Uh, super excited to speak with her. Um, I think it's going to be a great show. She's a fellow podcaster. We're going to talk about all of that. Uh, she keeps ball pythons and colubrids like myself. So I think uh, we'll probably align on on some thoughts uh, that from the conversations pre-show. Uh, I think we will, but it's going to be a fun show tonight, guys, and I hope we'll end it. As per usual, just some housekeeping stuff. Um, as always, guys, I do have Meteoric Serpents t-shirts available in multiple sizes. If you are interested, feel free to send me a DM on Instagram. By the way, guys, I did say before the show, I didn't tell everyone that if we got to 1,500 followers on Instagram, I'd give away a couple t-shirts on the stream. If you guys do that during the show, I'll still hold that promise. Uh, we're at 1486, so 14 to go. Uh, if I don't have Instagram followers here, give me a follow. Uh, speaking of that, all my social medias are down here below. There's also links to those in the description. Uh, also, hit that like and subscribe on today's video because uh, in looking at my analytics, about 35% of you don't subscribe, which I don't know why. If you're watching, if you're enjoying, hit that subscribe button because you're going to see this every single week. I really love doing this, guys. I, I say it all the time. Uh, this podcast has reinvigorated um, some more love for Colubrids. It's just been super awesome having some really great guests on. So hope you're all enjoying it too. And you could show that you enjoy it by hitting that like and subscribe. Um, also, make sure you are supporting US Arc, guys. US Arc is the uh, group, the organization that fights for our rights as reptile keepers, uh, prevents from any legislation, whether it's state or nationally, um, getting passed to prevent us from keeping our pets and, you know, these animals that we love. And it's also people's businesses too, guys. I mean, you don't want your businesses being taken away. That's very, very un-American. So make sure you're supporting um, U.S. Arc to make sure that doesn't happen. Also, sorry, I forgot to say Morph Market. I do have some animals available. I did sell a couple, um, but there's still a few on there. So go check them out if you are interested Next, uh, if you are looking to diversify your diet, make sure you go check out Blake's Exotic Feeders on Instagram. I personally use it. He is local to me. I go and pick up quail locally, uh, and I'm able to diversify between rodents and uh, poultry for my colubrids. And I think it's great. I think it's uh, you know good to diversify the diet because in the wild, these animals are likely eating multiple prey items. Um, you know, depending what species we're talking, but my colubrids, all my rat snakes tend to go crazy for quail. So I highly recommend it. Uh, send him a DM if you are interested. You could even ask me for a price list because I have his price list sha uh, saved. Sorry. Um, next, uh, on Friday nights, every other Friday, which will be this coming Friday, uh, I do a segment now on the Trap Talk Reptile Network with Alvaro from Clover's Reptiles. We do, thank God it's Colubrids. Just me and him kind of shooting the shit, talking about Colubrids. Uh, it's a lot of fun. So we've been, well, we did one episode so far. We enjoy that. So thank you to MJ. And last but not least, first link in the description is the Meteoric Serpents Patreon. If you want some more behind the scenes of what goes on here. Also, if you just want to support me and what I'm doing with this podcast and you want to help, um, me make it bigger and better. You can help doing that by supporting me uh, on the Patreon. Plus, we're going to have an awesome group chat with the patrons and uh, just great community building, guys. Uh, let's see who is in the chat before we bring Jessica out. I know I'm keeping her for a while. Creative Coralophis. I hope I pronounced that right. Thank you for being here. Alvaro, what's up, dude? Hell yeah. Always down for some Kaluber knowledge. Scott from Morph Magic Exotics, thank you for being here. Ryan, Morph Valley Reptiles, thanks for being here. Head Honcho of the V Unit, the Lorena Reptiles, thank you for coming out. Chantel, thank you for being here. Chris from BNS, also a former guest of the podcast, thanks for being here. 
Derek, thanks for coming out. Andrew, what's up, man? I'm pretty sure I saw that you subscribed today. I appreciate that. Thank you for doing that. Uh, let's see. And Morphmaster J, Johnny, what is up, man? All right, guys, without further ado, let's bring her out. Let's talk to Jessica about her Colubrid collection. What's up? How are you? Good. How are you? I'm doing well. All right. Uh, <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on the show. I know it was kind of last minute notice, but I appreciate mm -hmm. you taking the time to uh, come on and talk about this stuff. Cause you know, I I've seen your YouTube like here and there, and I feel like you do a lot of stuff on the, there's a lot of ball Python content on your YouTube between the auctions and the other stuff like that. But on Instagram, you post a lot of your colubrid. So I'm actually really excited to talk to you about, you know, that whole side of your collection today as well. <clears throat> Yeah, I think ball, more people are interested in ball pythons. Period. So if not you wrong. Want, you're not wrong. If you want YouTube views, uh, <laughs> interview a big ball python breeder, right? Like yeah. that's how you get it. Not not interview a niche colubrid breeder of a rare species of colubrid that ten to five people are interested in. <laughs> so yeah, the math doesn't math. You know, if yeah. you do weird stuff, right? Well, you know, uh, some people want to hear some some good conversations sometimes. They like going against the grain, but the ball python stuff is cool too, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but as we get into it, I, I want you to, you know, for people who don't know about you, and I and I actually don't, what's your kind of your background uh, with reptiles? How'd you get into it? You could kind of go as long or short as you want with that. That's like a two hour discussion. <laughs> I'm sure it is for most people if they really want to stretch it out. Okay. I let the, the, the two minute uh, version is uh, like dinosaurs when I was little. I thought they were awesome. Got an yeah. iguana when I was 10. Not that great of a pet, turns out. Surprise. <laughs> so yeah. my mom traded that in for a bow at a pet store, and the, the bow was like my favorite. So okay. I had a bow at 12. And I sort of like just kept it as a pet for a long time. And then I started to be like, get into like the breeding game and like learning about breeding. And like, I don't know, you could get different bow morphs at that point. This is like 2002, right. one, 2000 okay. time frame. So I started to buy boas, build a collection. And I had like ATBs and leopard geckos and corn snakes and all kinds of other random common stuff, sunbeams, ahitula, whatever, whatever I could get my grubby little kid hands on, I was getting right. It, right? But I really like okay. boas <laughs> a lot. And then, so I like pared down the collection a bunch. I just had boas and ATVs sort of at the end. And then it looked like arena virus or whatever got into my collection. So a bunch of them started to die. And then I kept them for a little while, took them to the vet, did all this kind of stuff. And at that time there was no test for arena virus. And then okay. by 2008, I euthanized everyone because you really? couldn't tell them apart <laughs> okay. if they were infected or not. And it was you couldn't sell them and you couldn't keep them because they would die. And so I euthanized all of them. And that was lame. Okay. So I stopped doing that. Yeah. And then I did my undergrad in like environmental science and was doing wood turtle research. Okay. And then to my cool. master's, it, I was like, I thought of different thesis topics I ended up doing wood turtles again I'm like a, a one trick wood turtle pony okay. <laughs> as far as field research goes cool so I was actually like paid to run around the bushes uh and look for turtles that was pretty fun and I and I thought about doing my PhD and I could have done it obviously I don't know if it's I guess it's not obvious but but I just decided I, was, I would at that point I was like 27 28 I was, I was okay. sort of aging out of breeding as a human so either you choose to do your PhD or you choose to breed. That was like the, the choice. <laughs> so I was like, I don't know, fuck it. I'll just go uh, find a, a man, just lure him in with my feminine <laughs> wiles, right? And yeah, and it, and I I was successful. I tricked okay. a man to marry me. <laughs> this is a life story. There it's going go. longer than two minutes. <laughs> fuck. Okay, let's skip forward. And so we we got married. We did whatever married people do wink and then uh, uh we moved to washington because he was in the air force okay and we were gonna buy a house i'm like let's get a farm because i like animals obviously farm animals yeah. whatever and then there was a an a, an adu on the property 
And I was like, yeah, that'd be good in an ADU. Not a rental for people, but put a bunch of fucking snakes in it. Okay. So then I got back in in 2019, starting with Boas, my first love. Oh, really? So you only got I you know what? I honestly kind of thought you been doing this like as big as you've been doing it for a bit longer. But 2019. No, I did so like there's like 10 years in there of right yeah of course whatever so like i've flipped hellbenders and tag turtles and done rattlesnakes and all kinds of weird stuff (laughs) okay that was my my jam nice awesome well that's cool and then uh so you started with boas and then how did the collection kind of evolve there because you have a pretty diverse collection so what did your interest just start peaking in in different places in the hobby or like what kind of got you to where you currently are so tips buckler is still around you know yeah yeah yeah. so when i was a little baby my first collection before i reduced it down to just boas and atbs okay it it had everglades rats um corn snakes and some other what else did i have i don't know and I would always like gaze long and at Tim's website because uh, yeah. it was the same then as it is now, which is crazy. <laughs> yeah. Like it's powerful juju that, that it's still the same. So if any third eye.com or whatever, third eye reptiles. Yeah. yeah. Everybody Google it. Look at the pictures. They're very nice. Yeah. Tim, so, Tim's got one amazing pictures and two just amazing, like locality animals and stuff. Like all, all his pictures look fantastic, but yeah. 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 So, so it back then i was like oh i, I want uh we used to call them kisatashi corns because you could see that on kathy love's website could never get them okay. um i i wanted climax couldn't 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 find them in my dumb kid pet store obviously <laughs> <laughs> right bard i couldn't find them in my dumb kid pet store yeah uh, so when i so I had boas. I was putting together the, the boa breeding groups um, based on like morphs that I liked. And I always liked morphy mud boas because that's what I had originally. And like the first extra species I added was hognose. Okay. Which, which is, I guess, maybe people don't know because I'm largely a corn snake breeder now, but I just like hognose. So I definitely I saw hognose. some. Ho- yeah, I saw some hogs when I was scrolling through. I always do some little background research. I have to see what species you're keeping so I know what the hell we're talking about. Right. But yeah, I saw I saw quite a bit. So yeah, yeah. and I and I thought they were f- fine, but to me they're not. Uh, they're they're no corn snake. Let me put it that way. They're right. they're cute or whatever, but that's like their only benefit. They're much harder to take care of than corn snakes or other rat snakes, frankly. They're weird. They scream at you when you try to take care of them. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just like this pet is not that good at being a pet, but everybody loves them and they are pretty cute. My husband likes them, so I'm keeping them happy. Let's keep cool. going. Keep going with that. Okay. Then I added corns um, pretty early. Climax Russians. Yeah. I'm trying to think of like the order of operations here. Russians. Stuff like that, but I had a lot of it as babies, so like it, okay. it wasn't really producing. The climax I got adults or nearly adults. Nice. So that's so I have been able to produce them longer, but I got a bunch pretty early because you know I don't know. And then I, I also got balls that same summer, okay, too. But I got adults, so I was able to produce them faster than got it. All of those random colubrids, uh, okay, that I got as babies. Yeah. Cool. So kind of breaking down um, into the colubrid collection first, let's talk about like the corn snakes, because I'd say you definitely have a lot of them. And that's definitely a very morph heavy uh, animal. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about some of your corn snake projects. And forgive me, because I, I've talked about it before, but my corn knowledge is very I'm not as hip with the the newer morphs i i know like some of the old school things i used to work at a pet store where we bred um and you know i used to work with like some of the more simple simpler ones but like i see all those um 
oh man, what is it like the cinder and, mm-hmm. and all these other genes that like I never saw like 10 years ago or so. Um, so talk about your corn snake projects if you. So corn snakes for me are like boas on steroids. So everything I like about boas, you can just do it faster <laughs> and make right. more of them. So like selective breeding is like the most satisfying part of breeding anything yeah really yeah more stacking you know boring i mean do it okay you need to but like the ability to curate pairs groups trios lineages to get a specific phenotype in the end is what uh gets me up in the morning um so i want to do that in boas but you know females take four to they six take, years yeah. to grow up very long time we're saying so like oh, whatever it's like it's a fast turnaround. You have a lot of sort of fulfillment, a lot of satisfaction. You can really move the corn snake needle forward right. in, in snake world pretty fast. Obviously, like leopard geckos would be faster or whatever. Yes. But if you're going to pick a snake, a corn snake is an easy like platform to do it in. So I focus on currently like Miami Okatee and then various Miami crosses and then okay. shatter crosses, which is cinder sun kissed and like doing okay. different things with that the shatter stuff is cool that's the stuff it's where crazy. i see where i see like corns and i've never been i like even now i still kind of i'm just like do i want corns like i see some cool ones but then i see the shatters and i'm like i might want corns shatters are like literally transformative because it's not like you know a snow makes sense right you take away the the black take away the melanin yep. Take it there, and then it turns pink. Okay, it makes sense. Shatter, yeah. no one would expect a shatter. <laughs> right. Like, it's too crazy. Yeah. No, that that's super cool. Um, And yeah, I, I also, I agree with you about, like, the line breeding stuff with these colubrids. Because I think that's something that um, some other species lack a bit. Like, you know, we're, we're going to talk about them later. But the ball pythons, like, no one's really, like trying to line breed ex- except those specific lines that you know have names or whatever of, of certain mm-hmm. things like but besides those uh no one really tries you you know you're just smushing a bunch of genes together right but you know i even work with the the scaleless texas rat snakes and i produce some beautiful holdback animals that i'm like i can't wait to produce these or like to breed them down the mm-hmm. line and see what the hell i can get offspring wise um but yeah yeah, I mean, it's also true of, like, animals that are relatively homogeneous in terms of their looks. So, like, Climax all look kind of the same. Uh, yes. You know, bamboo rat snakes all look kind of the same. So, like, yeah. to me, that's almost equally as boring. Like, I'm glad they're rare and I can, like, get a pair in somebody's hands for them to breed. But, like, the species that are polygenic to begin with have lots of phenotypes in the wild. And you have something to do. You have pro- goals, phenotypes, phenotype plus stack of morph, whatever. Those are the my right. favorite species to work with. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, hundred percent. Especially the, uh, in my opinion, the North American rat snakes are just like the absolute best for that. Just as a group, as a whole, because of how variable they are within their respective species slash mm-hmm. subspecies however you want to uh call taxonomy nowadays but like you, you know again I, I always go back to the texas rats but like man every single one you produce you gotta let them age a little bit but they're so variable same thing with corns like you're not really gonna have i, I mean and i'm sure you will like generically like you know you have corn looks but like you have corns that age differently and they just you know turn into these Uh, beast and they go through that uh, i'll call it an occ but you know they go through that color change from their baby look and then they turn into something fantastic so i think that's something very cool in the hobby that i think we're seeing kind of go towards more but it 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 is within these like selective species and groups right and then the the species the people who enjoy the species have to value it so you could selectively yeah. breed ball pythons until you your heart is full of joy but 
no one will value that in the marketplace. Like you could yep. be like, oh, it's pretty nice or whatever. And and it's, but it's still a pastel. It doesn't matter if it's the nicest pastel ever. It's still $50. Yeah. So like, yeah, you want to do this, have these feelings in a species where someone will value your work or whatever, or you, you have to like convince people, you know, with YouTube videos or whatever, that your pastel yep. is really nice and deserves to be $70. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 70 over 50 right right that's the that's the price premium for 10 yep. years of selective breeding of pastel ball pythons yeah i guess there i don't go. know i'm being a little shit a little bit but <laughs> it's all good it's all good uh you you know i i know you saw the title beforehand but like we're gonna we're gonna talk about it we're not we're not here to make fun of ball pythons we both keep ball pythons but mm -hmm. you know there's there's conversations to be had uh about like the dichotomy of keeping and breeding those two groups of animals but yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah there's nothing there's no let me just be extremely clear there's nothing wrong with ball pythons the people who no. only want to keep ball pythons go ahead <laughs> I no i think you should diversify i know i, I tell people that but then they're like yeah. i don't want anything else if you truly don't want anything else don't get anything else because you're not going to take care of it right yeah it's just <sighs> ball pythons is a vibe a very specific vibe and it requires keeping and breeding in a way that is totally different than every other kind of species total. Like, like yeah. the, the speed of turnover of males is so fast. It's insane. The speed of turnover yep. of females, you know, you could only breed her one or two times. And then she's like, there's not enough room for, for her anymore. And I'm, I'm like, I can have right. the same boa for 15 years and she'd still be good. Like she's not yeah. broken. <laughs> I, yeah, exactly. Uh, so that all that's different and it's fine that it exists. It's just a vibe. Right. But if yeah. so for, for some people that becomes exhausting, be like every year, if I don't buy a new $8,000 mail, I'm falling behind so fast that in three years, I basically have a completely obsolete collection. That's kind of how it is. Yeah. And I don't ever want to feel like that. That's that's the thing too. It's like I I don't I don't want to have to pay 8 grand every year for one animal where I'm like, "Okay, you get you get your time to shine and then it's over." Sure, yeah, right, just one season or two. And yeah. maybe three if they're like really good and power. I don't know. That part it's just irritating because like it doesn't have to be that way. The reason why it's so yeah. fast is because so many people breed them and breed them with such intensity and such efficiency that like the market's always moving on really quickly. Yep. Yep. But there's other markets where we're not really moving anywhere. They're always the, the same price. <laughs> you know, you breed yeah. whatever a bamboo rat snake species, it, it's the same price last year and and to this year. I mean, exclude like COVID spike crap, but like, yeah. You know, it's just like a bamboo rat. It's, yeah, that that three to four hundred range. Like, I don't, I don't foresee that changing because people buy at that price all day long. Um, right, and and nobody's like blasting bamboo rats, like breeding hundreds of females. So that there's nobody yeah. that's going to nerf the market on bamboo rats. I think, hopefully, no. <laughs> but like that sort of steadiness is is very helpful uh, for yeah. mental sanity for me. You know, yeah. I feel like I could sell a Japanese rat snake. Uh, all day not at a show though don't ever take him to a show <laughs> but online they would just go they just go yeah it's fine yeah and let, let's talk about some of those because we're talking about it those asian species you have and that, like i know you have the uh the japanese rats the climax um uh as well as the bamboos you have the porphyrisia do you have multiple i saw you posted um Again, I was just scrolling through. I think you posted a broad banded, which is Latisinctus, correct? Mm -hmm. That's the yeah. only one I have. I that is the only one. Okay. Pick up. They're okay, but to me, there's a better small Asian rat snake, and that's Diamond's rat snakes. So, like, okay, I don't because the bamboos just spend a lot, a lot of time hiding. They do. You're right. You are correct. A lot of time. So like, but Dion's are like just as outgoing and chill as like a corn snake. They'll bask out and yeah. do whatever. And they also come in orange. So like, 
Yep. But they also come in black, gray, olive, yellow, striped, blotched, spotted, crazing. They have ev everything and more. And so, like, uh, to me, like, I like my babies. They're cool. I, but I won't, don't want a huge colony of them ever, really. Okay. I do want a huge colony of tyrants. Nice. Yeah. Uh, and, and even that, like, that comes down to opinion. Because, like, my appeal with them, and, and I get that they hide all the time because I 100% agree with you. Um, mm -hmm. I just, I enjoy looking at them. Like, every time I open that tub and I get to see my cocci or the volanti i'm just like that's such an awesome animal i'm like it's just so cool they like that cool. and that and that's what i get out of it and even picking them up like i know some other breeders do too i'll i'll use a hook because i really don't care because they are so they're so startled when you take them out taking mm -hmm. they're very cage uh defensive um you touch them and they're flipping around on you right away but once you once you get them out and onto your hands like they're actually pretty chill sometimes as adults they are yeah i it's just like i don't know i an ideal animal is something you can selectively breed breed relatively easily fits in your room whatever your management yeah. situation is in your room and in a pinch becomes a good pet for someone who's not a breeder yeah. Right. Like that's like how I define like a good species. So like bamboo rats can be a good pet, but like, I think they they're the actually great pets. Are they the best pet though? I wouldn't say the best, but I did. Cause I they think... hide and they like little graboid monsters that. Yeah. Well, they're yeah. The, the they... substrate. <laughs> Amazing feeding response. Uh, the cox I actually, my Volanti, I have to drop feed. It will not eat off of tongs, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. The cox I come flying out at me. Um, but I also think the matter of them staying small, being allowed to be room temperature, that's what I think helps to make them mm -hmm. good pets. Right. Because you, you could keep them uh, I don't know. I Because I, I don't keep in tanks anymore, but like 20 long a 20 long might be a little small uh perhaps like a like a 30 gallon like you don't need much bigger than that and you don't need much height because they're not climbing they're they're fossorial mm -hmm. um but yeah the the room temperature thing i think is huge with asian colubrids and that's why i think they're underrated right it, it's hard though because like i don't know uh there's a price point where something is only really being bought by like advanced keepers and advanced hobbyists. And I feel like maybe 400 starts to get out of the pet range. And so yeah, like, you might if be they right. come back down to more than 200, you would have better movement at shows or whatever. But right. I don't know. I, 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 whatever people produce, it just should, should not ruin the pet keeper's life once you sell it to them is yeah what i'm 100%. into mostly <laughs> yeah yeah so that's why I like i like diamonds because they they remind me a lot of corn snakes in terms of personality they're even s smaller than corn snakes they're like bamboo rat size but okay. they're relatively outgoing and fun and super super polygenic so like and how many of those do you do you keep because i think i totally missed that on your social media four Okay. Four, I have four adults. Nice. <laughs> yeah, I I want like a, a million. I would love a, a huge import from Europe of all kinds. Because they have a huge yeah. range. Yeah, you know, so they come in all kinds of colors, phases. So I have right. like a yellow one. I have two orange lot of Vostoks, and then I have a melanistic lot of Vostok. Okay. So, I don't know. It's just you can't. They're just so cute and weird. They have really short incubation times. It's only like a month. Really? Okay. And so the babies are born really big because uh, they have they're really big. big. Okay. Yeah. So like a really because they're from somewhere where it's really cold, so they would need to like quickly lay eggs. Hopefully, they incubate and hatch in that small window of time of summer. Right. So since the babies are born relatively big, it they I feel like they'll be easier to sell <laughs> at shows because they won't look small, but then they don't yeah. get that big as adults. So it's like a win win for me. 
Now that's the tough thing about corns for me. And, and maybe you could speak to this because you produce a ton of them and, and maybe my memory is just not great. I feel like when I walk around shows a lot and I'm seeing corns in their respective deli cups, I see a lot of them that I'm just like, I would never sell this at a show. How, how, what's your opinion are people not feeding them well are they feeding are they bringing fresh out of the egg animals are they incubating too fast and they're hatching out super tiny like what do you think is going on there what do you see from your hatchling corn they are just born really small i know yeah and i know they're born so you small, can feed but... them 12 times and bring them to a show and they're still five grams or whatever okay so like okay isn't that enough times technically or whatever? Yeah, no, I, I would agree with you. Yeah, obviously, it, again, it, it depends on the breeder. Because because people are like, what the fuck are these worms? Like, they, they, it doesn't even look like anything. Right. <laughs> when you look at the deli, you're like, what is in here? So they do sell better the bigger they get because they're like, oh, I can tell it's a pink and white snake now instead of a worm. Yeah. Or whatever. Okay. But – the other problem is that some people, flippers in particular, as always, uh, don't feed them. Yeah. They're just born and they sell them in in that condition. Right. So, or it was fed once. Like if you go to like the, the national wholesalers that sell to pet stores, their requirement for buying corn snakes is fed once. Really? <laughs> so, so as long as it is eaten one time, it will go to your local petco. So it okay. could be any size based on like the size of the egg, right? Gotcha. Okay. Some some corn snakes lay eggs that are I don't know like nickel size sometimes. Like if the mom's small, they don't even yeah. necessarily make it long. <laughs> They'll just make like a nickel, and so that baby comes out. It might be a, a couple grams. Yeah, it it really interests me so much because I feel like I've seen people post what I perceive as like small moms and i'm just like how are these animals breeding i'm like that's crazy um yeah I have a it lot seems of to work moms. and they do well yeah it, it's interesting because i wouldn't think so but it seems like they do well and people are like nah they're they're fine um yeah there's a lot like, of okay. horse steak lines that don't get even to 300 grams females yeah ever like depending on like if they were from south florida originally or whatever the dna mix is in there Right. The more northern ones do get bigger, the more western ones. But I definitely have female corn snakes that are four years old and sub 300 grams. And I, and I okay. don't make them obese. So, like, some people, like, mess around with that. But, like, they just can be small, too. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. And, guys, by the way, uh, for the chat, if anyone has any questions for either myself or Jessica, uh, feel free to throw it in there. And... We'll add it to the conversation as we go. But uh, yeah, I like to have that interaction. All right. Awesome. And then talk about your, yeah, your Japanese rat snakes. Cause like you were kind of mentioning those and you're right. They are kind of that one tone snake, but like they're, they're very cool. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I like them a lot. And in my opinion, and plus from learning from other people, they seem to be the most North American looking Asian rat snake. Like they have the head, the head structure, head shape, like mm -hmm. kind of the scalation, like it looks very similar. Uh, what's been your experience like with those guys? They are a lot like Pantherophis in yeah. general. They're, they're more the size of like Obsoletus or whatever, not anything else. They they like it a little warmer than like a bamboo or whatever, but they don't necessarily want to have a basking spot that's like taking up the whole enclosure right. so if like the ambient gets into like 82 to 84 that's too hot they'll go like run to their water bowl but they will go sit under that like a heat panel or whatever if the whole room is in the 70s like if you truly keep them at ambient so i wouldn't keep them with no heat at all um they're they're really cool because they're like they're not as difficult to keep hypothetically as rhino rats you yeah. get a lot of the same color, not exactly, but like the same idea. So it's like an easy keeping rhino rat with the same yeah. color palette. <sighs> the hard part is like because they do go through an ontogenetic color change too. Yeah, you don't know how blue they'll be unless you look at the parents. <laughs> okay, right? 
and that's sort of and probably... have, have you seen noticeable like line breeding effects from the ones you've produced in terms of that kind of coloration not yet it's gonna take like <clears throat> multiple generations of like okay. raising up babies like i saw gotcha. babies i bred the first year 2021 a female and even though she has bred to me her color development hasn't finished yet okay <laughs> which is you're like what it's like they like they glow up they, they just keep glowing up even if after they're yeah. sexually mature they'll just keep getting more blue so i i think they're like finished maybe at four or five or so and then obviously they're more blue in this maybe it's not obvious they're more blue in the spring than they are as the season winds down they're really okay. blue and like wired up right when they come out of brumation after that first shed especially the males the males get really blue and you're like this is a fun time of year it's like hormonal blue or something yeah and, yeah it's probably get, what it is they'll get less blue when they're in brumation but what we need is is exanthic right because there is exanthic in japan but japan's closed but if we, it just happened to pop up in the United States or it comes out of somebody's pants or whatever, <laughs> we could guarantee a, a blue, a very strongly blue snake. With right. Because then it's just blue and gray. Right. I think that's what they hypothesize about the very blue rhino rats as well, that it's a xanthism. Um, it's just fully lacking yellow, and that's what's making... A blue rhino because i know it there's not many here in the states i know in europe they have a lot more of those blue really, lines really as blue well ones. yeah yeah like there's a, a youtube video on i don't know somebody's herping around in japan and he's an english speaker i think he's just there visiting and he like flips okay. a tan on the side of the road and and it's outside of tokyo so it's not even like in northern japan okay and he he flips an exanthic climax that's just blue and gray. You're like, oh, really? There's one. <laughs> so it obviously exists, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so we could, uh, I don't know, independently have the mutation happen here or whatever and uh, start right. working on that. But as far as like selective breeding for more blue, it just takes so long, in my opinion, from what I've seen so far, to know for sure how blue they will end up. It's going to take like 15 years to. I, I'm doing it. I'm 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 in. But like when yeah. I look at babies, I can't evaluate them by how blue they are currently. Okay. I can't evaluate them at one year, and I can't evaluate them at two years. I only think I can evaluate them at three years. It has to be like five years before you're like, that's the final blueness effect on this animal. Right. Which is a lot. I gotcha. of Selective breeding. Yeah. No, that's cool though, and that that's cool that you're kind of sticking to your guns there and and going for that. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, they're they're very cool uh, in general. Though I wish I could get uh, Japanese four lines. You seen those? Okay. Um. What What's the scientific? Quadrilineata. I'm not sure that I have. So they. They have like a, a sort of carinata head. Okay. And more of a racery body. But they What's have like Let me try to pull weird it ellipsoid pupils. And in the stripe form, the pupils will be red or orangey color. And then they have a melanistic version, which they call the Krasuno Habi, which is like the crow snake. So it's like wow. a big black rat snake. I mean, another black rat snake. I don't know how many we need, but I want another one, right? My understanding, oh, everyone I've ever messaged about them, they were in the hobby and were lost. So if anybody has one in their basement, I'll take one. Thank you. Oh, we sharing? Yeah, I think I've... Is that it? Mm -hmm. So when they get... So they're sort of uh, banded-ish when they're babies, and then when they grow up, they become... They look sort of like a yellow rat snake with four lines. Yeah, I kind of like see that base. See that? Like that? The first one. First one. Yeah. Yeah. See how they have like a ellipsoid pupil and like a yeah. red eye. Mm. Love them. It's cool. Yeah. Too bad we killed them all. 
and they're like uh, uh like a big garter snake basically like they're i was gonna say it kind of reminded me of almost like a yellow rat and like a garter put together yeah isn't that crazy they, they, yeah. they like to eat fish and frogs and stuff oh, but wow. they'll take rodents too but i'm just like i just want this weird giant frog rat snake from japan can't have it though yeah you always what yeah. want what you can't have of course <laughs> every time yeah um and then i've also seen you post uh some some bear's rats some bear die uh which i'm definitely starting to come around to like i used to kind of i don't think i just ever paid attention to them but i started seeing them more in some of like the hypo bears and one you posted recently with this very like gunmetal gray color with some of like the red in there like mm -hmm. that's just fantastic I yeah mean, tim Spuck spuckler's website was what made me ever even want them to begin with because they're just they yeah. can be they can be insane like party party colors yellow pink orange red gun metal yep. you're like what kind of animal is that who like does design this animal <laughs> to yeah. look like this and so like I had to get some of those, added those to the to the ye old crew last year uh, when I was actually buying another pair of Climax because I, I just, I want as many Climax as possible <laughs> so I can like outcross, sell people unrated right. pairs, try to get them as blue as possible. So I, I was just like, the guy was selling them. I was like, ah, let's, let's get some Loma Altos there too, please. Yes, please. Thank you. <laughs> and I was talking to a guy down in the Odessa show and he herps down there a lot. And I was like, okay. are, are Loma Altos actually that much better? And he's like, no, like in the wild. No, they're not in the wild. When people, would, they just see them a lot there. So they could select out of all of the ones they were encountering the very craziest. And he's like, if you want really good Bardi, just buy the ones in captivity. Cause they're already infinitely better than the ones in the wild anyway. Okay. I'm like, oh, interesting. Thank you for telling me. Because most of them are a Lisa Frank pattern with gunmetal scales on top in the wild. They're like right. just kind of a little bit of yellow and orangey, dusty color with gray, right? Yeah. So, so I was like, oh, interesting. You don't necessarily need to to herp them up to get like the best of the best. The best of the best is already here. Yeah, that's what I kind of. That's what I wonder about again I, I always go back to the my like the texas rats i keep i'm like i wish someone could find me or i can go and just like go and pick out the best one i could find from the wild but like how much looking is it going to take to find one mm -hmm. that really that really makes me go like i need to work with that in my collection um because i have some interesting colored ones and now they do happen to be triple hats but i have one that that's like pinned to my instagram that has a lot of like green and yellowish color and mm -hmm. then that one's i believe it's its sister um it's a little bit darker but there's some nice browns and there's almost like pinks and whites in the pattern and i'm just like you're not finding this in the wild. Like, like you're saying, like, you're just not going to, you're very likely not going to find that animal in the wild. And then I have someone from someone that's line bird. That's like a very red Texas ride. And I'm like, well, that one you might not find either, but I know some people who have found some cool stuff or, um, so yeah, it, that, that's an interesting conversation for sure. Is like how, how nice can you, uh, get from the wild or how long is it going to take to find that, that wow factor animal? Right. You might have to work, a particular county for 20 years to find yeah. a pair that are, live like, in Texas, so. that are like meeting your standards or whatever. Like if you ever yeah. go on iNaturalist, you ever go on iNaturalist? You know what? I I should, and I'm lacking that okay. I don't. Well, go look at all the Texas rat snakes. Like I'll go yeah. there to look at whatever I'm interested in. Just to see like, what's the density of like, you know, the dogs versus like the premium. Right. there's a lot of dogs out there that you know they that because it's better to be like really dark and muddy and kind of brown of any species, of course right <laughs> yep yep so like Blend in. like i want more slowinski eyes so one of these days one of these days i'm gonna do uh probably the brian college station herp show and like herp that night or whatever but like the amount of slowinski eye dogs in that county is actually like pretty high but there's some little spots here and there where they're non-dogs which would 
be ones you would be like willing to get. Yeah. Uh, so it, it almost has to like either have a bud who lives there or like go down there every spring when the males are running around crazy and just right. burp every spring to find a couple of non dogs. But like, yeah. what's the point of outcrossing to a dog? You know? Yeah, exactly. And mm -hmm. well, speaking of that, Alvaro was asking in the chat, what's your opinion on outcrossing with wild caught animals? Do you have experience with that? Or would you do that? I have experience with that. Uh, I guess I don't have experience with that. I I would do it if you if you feel like you're having problems with inbreeding depression in, in some way. But whatever you're doing for selective breeding just sort of goes away. So if, if the project yeah. is more based, whatever it is, yeah, I'll cross the shit out of it. You know, like... Well, keep... Alvaro's... I, I don't know if you're familiar with him. He works... Hognose. Uh, with hognose yeah mm -hmm. so and i had the conversation with him when i brought him on the show because i was actually quite curious because i feel like you know hognose have had this huge boom over the last couple of years but i never see anyone talk about having you know just a wild type or having locality hognose uh, locality western hognose just sitting in their collection as like an outcrosser people, like like uh, yeah what, buchanan uh exotics reptiles He's in Texas, so he'll okay. outcross. He'll sell like F one lemon ghosts that are from a oh, wild caught from his yard. Gotcha. To a lemon ghost, if that's something people want, there's a market for that. It's just it's not, you know, every, all the work you did to make sure they all start on pinkies goes away the second you outcross or what you know. It's yeah, like the selective it's breeding for like good feeding and stuff right. goes away when you do that. Of course. And and you're right. It's also hard to make that stuff marketable because it's like you're selling a bunch of hats, but it's also quite important for the hobby. Like, I think it's definitely something for all of us to kind of consider and think about, especially with these animals that are, excuse me, heavily morph influenced, uh, where we're just not taking a lot of wild stock and perhaps there's less in the hobby. Like even, even the bamboos, like, you know, it's unfortunate we can't get more, but we for those who have them and want to breed them, we should strive our best to try to take the most unrelated individuals possible mm -hmm. because they're so the original starting breeding stock was so small. Yeah. Anytime you get outcross, even if it's not too wild caught, that's a good management strategy for keeping your colonies going through yep. time and not causing some sort of inbreeding depression eventually which happens eventually but i don't there are time there's a time and a place for people to be bringing a well caught for genetic diversity and there's lots of times and places where most people don't need to do that because you know wild cots have lots of interesting worms yeah <laughs> lots, yeah lots of worms lung worms all kinds of cool stuff and you know crypto is sometimes more common in captive collections and then every once in a while some people will blame wild cots for them but i think it's just like how those kinds of people keep which is like sloppily and disgusting <laughs> not saying y'all are disgusting i'm just saying so like <laughs> so uh just be careful when introducing wild cots into any program maybe yeah. have a wild caught room so if you want to outcross of them a captive bred animal going to a wild caught room stays with those animals forever. Never goes back to the captive bred stuff. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it's, um, we're going to get into that eventually. Cause I, I know you're very big on biosecurity in general. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I do want to talk about the right. Yeah. I do want to talk about the rest of your collection first, but yeah, it's part of the reason why I like, I have a hard time, you know, thinking to myself, like, could I ever keep, a walk like i'm definitely not it, right now in this current position i'm not prepared to keep a wild caught animal and i would never ever bring one into my collection because i cannot manage whatever the hell that thing might have uh it's my mm -hmm. lack of knowledge my lack of resources i i just don't know so i definitely would have to brush up on that stuff and be very wary um for when that time comes because i'm sure it will as i you know want to expand my herpetocultural knowledge and and you know want to bring things into my collection but yeah yeah and a lot of people i don't know it's it's hard because a lot of people are like 
yeah, I bring a well caught shit all the time and nothing ever happens. But also, like, they sell it in two weeks. So, like, you never see the consequences of your actions. Right. Because like, you flip them in two weeks. And then some people are diligent, careful, methodical. And then they know, like, what the attrition rate is for wild caught when, like, the worm load overtakes the snake at the wrong time or whatever. And so they dehydrate and die. And so and, and you'll you'll figure out what your real loss rate is. Right. Because just because it's looks fine, it doesn't necessarily mean it's fine. Yeah. All the time. Yeah. Hundred percent. All right. Awesome. Before we get into some of the other stuff, can you please talk about uh the rest of your collection? Because obviously you still have plenty of animals. I know you are still keeping the boas. Uh you do a lot of the ball pythons. Let's um Let's do the boas first, because we'll save the the ball python for the the controversial conversations. Uh, however, however we want to go with that, but yeah, no, I'm kidding. So for Not boas, God, what do I have? I don't know, like eighty or something. I, I don't know. I don't keep track anymore. Okay, I, <laughs> it's so weird. So because sometimes I'm like, oh, I just have four hundred snakes, and then I'm like, no, I don't. Because I pull 150 pinkies to feed babies every week. So yeah. I have more than that. <laughs> if you yeah. count all of it together, don't tell right. anybody I said that, especially not my husband. Okay. Um, so for boas, when I was like a sweet little baby, VPI was still qu quite rare and expensive, VPI albino. Okay. So when I got back in, that was something I was like most interested in. So that's a lot of the collection. I do run okay. Paradigm. You know what that is? I'm I'm really not that familiar with the boa morphs. Okay. That's okay. It doesn't matter. Nor, nor species, are. to be completely honest. <laughs> okay, so nor species. Damn. Um so I'm not crazy. Boas have never been you know what? I I grew up in if you didn't know, I grew up in New York City and oh, when I worked at the pet okay. store, yeah, we couldn't have boas at that pet store so i never really got like that's why colubrids have always been my thing kind of because i i those were the only snakes i could interact with mm -hmm. for a very long span of my life until i moved down to florida and then i started getting ball pythons so yeah all right uh okay i know i know a little bit the tldr is there's locality boas and morph boas. yes yes right and so yep, most I, of the morph boas are sort of either straight up mutts like literal hybrids or at okay. least locality neutral imperator that's, okay yeah that's just the way it is okay yeah so i have mostly those i do have a couple longicata that i'll just keep pure and i have a sigma that okay. is pure sigma um but i because i started with mutts a long time ago that's what i got back into but i'm in like vpi and paradigm which is the alila combo of sharp albino and boa and caramel and what the fuck else do i have oh cat plus so like burkstone t positive albino okay God. <laughs> How many boas do I have? So in general, it's a it's I a lot of morph. BCI morphs, though. Yes, yes. Yeah. And okay. I, my favorite boas are always like pale, desaturated, no color, boring boas, and that's not a boa that exists anymore. And it's a boa that existed when I was in the hobby twenty years ago. Gotcha. So I've just been like bitching about not being able to work my favorite selective breeding project in boas for the last five years. Okay. Because like the the pool of possible boas that exist has changed so right. much, so much. They look totally different now than they did then, which sounds crazy because boas live a long time. So you think there'd be some that look the way they did 20 years ago? No. Yeah. I'm assuming they're all dead and we've moved on to later generations or whatever. So like I, I couldn't recreate the selective breeding project of my childhood because there I cannot find the animals to put together the project anymore. Got so then I'm like, I guess I'll breed corn snakes because like <laughs> the phenotypes are gone from the whole hobby. And I, right. Because we bred everything to like Nicaraguans and whatever it made even weirder mutts. Got it. And so a lot of the phenotypes are gone. So then I just got forced into corn snakes. So it wasn't even my fault. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Got oh, it. Okay. Fuck. Sorry. That was a lot. I was, I was dumping. 
it no, pisses me good. off, right? Because like I still have like a, a, a hard drive of all the snakes I had and then and euthanized, right? And I'm like, okay, I'm looking for this phenotype. I can't find it. I've been looking for five years. They're all gone or dead or bred out of the hobby or something. It's really? wild. I don't know what's going on. So <sighs> these people. <laughs> okay. So I bought a snake, a bow that's like 20 years old on purpose. And I'm like, maybe it'll look like the bows I used to know. And she sort right. of does. But just remember, shit can move on so fast and a whole species can either be gone completely or, or changed. If you don't protect whatever's in your collection, you know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Like if Sapometra had a fire, what would the hobby lose? Probably a lot. Let's just be honest. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I, I'm getting I'm getting snakes from Matt soon. So uh yeah, that'll be fun. Yeah. But uh yeah, no, that that would be. I mean, uh between what he has in his stock plus like uh saying like um both lineage and species wise and like the number that he has, but also some like rarities, like those uh red and black striped snakes he has. Though I know he mentioned um on snakes and sno snakes and sogies last week that he had or that there were some other people breeding them. But yeah, it's just the point that like, yeah, you're yeah, a hundred percent right. It can take literally here's a fun fact about the hobby. <laughs> Like it does, it almost doesn't matter what small collections are doing. A lot of times it's often like net producing collections that are the cornerstones of the hobby because they sell it to somebody who breeds it one time. And then that person gets out of the hobby, but those animals sort of disappear into to the ether. Right. And they may right. not go to a breeding home. So it's those cornerstone collections that actually like preserve the species in perpetuity in the hobby. So like, yeah. You know, if you're a little baby breeder now, your ambition should be to become a hypothetically a cornerstone species keeper for whatever species you want to be that for. Because lines can drift, species go disappear. You know, that's why the boas that I grew up with are gone, because no one was there to keep them around. They did yeah. other things with them. Yeah, 100 percent. It's it's, it's crazy <laughs> yeah no for sure um all right so then you have the boas and then am i did i miss anything besides the ball pythons before we get into that <sighs> oh lord i have jani ball snakes oh okay nice melanistic russians uh slowinski i hmm cave geckos do you care about those Probably not. oh you know what i did see those on your page those, those were really cool i've always liked those mm -hmm. I, yeah. they're really fun i'm trying to complete my like species of the japanese archipelago weeaboo nerd art nice <laughs> <laughs> that's what that is i'll get like nice. the sakashimi grass lizards or whatever the fuck they're called okay and then, whatever i'll do it it'll be fun why yeah. not no, I got to say the um, the some of the gecko species out there are so cool. Like the the cave geckos are one and even now I'm starting to come back around to leopard geckos and I'm like, "Oh boy. I used to keep a few as pets uh when I was younger, but um I've been seeing them some of them lately and just like the babies, I'm like, "Those are cute. Like I I'd like some leopard geckos again." Yeah, I got <laughs> a pair like, of leopard geckos off of the auction just for fun. Yeah, they are they are really cute. Like, yeah, I don't need 150. It doesn't need to be my like program or whatever. But they're really funny. The little tail. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, they're a great pet. Ten out of ten. Yeah, for sure. Cool. All right, so let's let's dive right into the ball pythons. What you got going on? <laughs> That's the uh, it's the topic of the night. What's oh, what's God. the ball python collection looking like? What's your What's your kind of like, I'll call it your mainstay project. What are you the most jacked about when it comes to ball pythons? I like dark gene hypo. Anything. Anything. Yeah. You put whatever pattern changer you want on it. But dark gene hypo is a, ideal in my heart. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, you can't go, you can't go wrong with that. Right. 
And I like if I had to pick like GHI and Blackhead are my favorite dark jeans. It's so, like yep. 90% of my collection is is one or the other, really. Or has plans to be in that eventually. Yep. And I am a like a basic white bitch and I like clown a lot. <laughs> so does everybody else. So like yeah. no surprise there. Um but like this like the crop of babies that are hypothetically maybe not this year, but like next year should be, a, I'm trying to go for a lot of super GHI combo clowns and super GHI Kryptons and super GHI het tri-stripe hypo, whatever. So, nice. so like, I don't know, just like way over doing a GHI and blackhead, super blackhead stuff. Okay. Super blackhead clowns, super blackhead tri-stripes, super blackhead. Cool whatever super blackhead pines because oh, yeah. i i don't know i just i like them sort of contrasty and complicated i do have other jeans should probably just get rid of them because i that's what i like you know what i mean like i have lab yeah. and i'm like why the fuck do i have lab why do i have this yeah. this is like not my color palette i'm, I'm kind of with you there i'm not i'm not <laughs> about the i i'm really not um I like them and I can appreciate them, but for me, the albino stuff does not do it for me. The lab, the ultramel, monarch, like like I just wouldn't have it in my collection. It's not stuff I want to breed personally. But like I know my buddy Brock at Morphinary Arts has made some banger ultramels, and I'm like, that's cool as shit. But right, I like really I'm just dark not gonna ultramels. Buy it. Like, like yeah, a blackhead, super blackhead. He made he made ultramel. like. He made a couple black pastel leopard ultras that were just smoking on fire. I got to see them in person. I'm like, man, those things are nice. Right. So, so yeah. So, I, if you can fix it with dark jeans, I'll probably keep it around <laughs> if that makes any sense. Right. Uh, it's just like a lot of other people have that same aesthetic. So, it's not like special or something. So, it's hard to figure out how to stand out in ball python land. Right. Yeah. I don't know how to stand out. But by the right. Way. Yeah. So that kind of brings me to the conversation because, again, we are in the same boat. So I'm interested to hear what your kind of mindset is on it. Um, pros and cons of like ball pythons versus colubrids in terms of you. I don't want to really put you into like a corner, but like if you had to really say which one, like you, I don't want to say prefer, but like which one, like, do you think you find like the most enjoyment out of like for certain reasons? I'm sure you have your kind of, again, pros mm -hmm. and cons about each and each of them. Cause there, there's definitely things to say about them, but I see you so into both that I'm interested to hear what your kind of thoughts are on them. Yeah, they definitely have pros and cons. And it's like, it's not clear cut. It's for some people it is. They're like, fuck, I have some hog nose and I don't ever want to start hog nose again. I'm going back to ball pythons. Like it's clear for them. Right. But to me, like everything has like a gradient of pros and cons. And so you're just weighing it out with your like personality room management style. Yeah. Right? Like in terms of raw satisfaction, the species, like I said, that can be selectively bred, they just win. They just win a hundred percent. Okay. Uh, even higher than like preservation of rare species, which I liked, I like doing that. I'm in, I'm in, but like the more you can work on it, think about the phenotypes, pick the perfect male for the perfect female, the better to me. So ball pythons sort of fall apart there. Okay, but ball pythons, what they do have is the the potential of dinkers, right? So you're yeah. you're doing the same eyeball check, and you're like, is this a morph? And you're so like it sort of satisfies in in that way. Okay, the, the if you're trying to do this as a hobby and you don't care about how much money you make or how much babies cost, then just literally breed whatever you want. <laughs> it's like it doesn't. Yeah, a hundred percent. But if you're trying to I don't know, full time it with colubrids. You can probably, but there is not as much market share for colubrids. Just, just yeah. total dollar amount 
that you could oh, 100%. Earn just doing yeah. Calibras at a show? Sorry. Ball pythons outsell every Calibra I have every time it shows. So, yeah. People don't like to hear that. They're like, no, if, if everyone just brought rare species to shows, shows would become perfect. No, that's not true. People want common, pretty, yep. easily understood <laughs> things that they expect to be there. Yeah. They'll even outsell corn snakes and boas, which are also pretty common and easily understood because they just want ball pythons. I don't know why. Don't ask me why. I don't know why. But they do. So, like, if there's some sort of financial incentive and you're trying to make happy pets for people, you should provide them with ball pythons, crested geckos, leopard geckos, and some rare stuff for the advanced hobbyists or whatever. Yeah. But I can't sell a Climac at a show, for example. I just can't do it. Nobody wants it. Nobody knows what it is. They don't understand it. And and as a baby, I, I assume it would be a bit harder. It's gray. It yeah. looks like a little gray. They're bigger than corn snakes, but they're definitely gray. Yeah. So like, and I've even seen them, not on my table, I never take an adult, but someone's selling a baby next to an adult they brought, and it's blue and green and teal and whatever. It's awesome. Babies still don't sell. People don't care outside of the hobby about your cool rare species. Sorry. <laughs> they just don't. Yeah. Only someone who like a like a refined aristocracy cares. You know, casual person number 72 at Podunk show at the back of the DFW hall doesn't care. They want a banana. Wow. Yeah. You know? Yeah. This is just a facts of life. So like No. Yeah, and and I definitely I'm not denying that whatsoever, but I think, you know, what you're saying rings true. And I think that's where like our job as, you know, like the Calibra keepers, like I, I think that's where we have to do better and step up and like do more to promote some of our species. Now, I, I think you do a fantastic job at that. I mm -hmm. think you, you post a lot on social media, like you're, you're active on, on YouTube, like you do all the stuff that you do. I post a lot. I, I do this show. So that's what I'm doing here I, is I'm trying to bring more knowledge. I'm trying to bring more awareness to these cool ass species that I think should be more popular. Um, the right. But the person who like Googles a YouTube video about Calubrids is already ready to receive the message that they, their next Calubrid will be, 100 flowers rat snake or whatever right they're yeah. already primed casual yeah. john q public at a show some of them could be ready right some of them but like most of them are not so whenever people just have to keep that in mind you know i've been yeah. next to like when people yell at ball python people for being like basic and boring i don't think they've ever vended multiple species and and seeing what happens <laughs> yeah. it's like i have ball pythons outsell in most markets maybe at like a tinley or pomona or something because you can be like the the hyper specialist of the show like i'm the boega daytona. guy they, they, daytona's well not for boega but yeah daytona <laughs> daytona is a colubrid show uh from what right. people say you can out niche in a big show but in these yeah. small local shows your best bet is to go for you could you could try to show stuff off they just yeah they just struggle they absolutely struggle yeah. so if you're going to be a pure colubrid person and you want to make it a full-time business you gotta breed rats or something or right. sell sell wood i don't know like it, it, the volume necessary far exceeds your uh, ability to vend it at these shows where the people don't want them anyway. Right. They sell much better online. Yeah, no, for sure. And I'm, I'm excited because I got my first kind of lick of vending experience this past year, but in my opinion, it wasn't, it was good to have the experience, but it wasn't good in the sense that I didn't have a ton of production. I was able to fill out one display, mm -hmm. but I had a lot of similar looking snakes because I had one ball python clutch and one Texas rat clutch, all of which the animals like now I'm going to start to have 
a lot more different looking animals. So I'll have more to offer. And now, like you're saying, I'm actually very curious to see if ball pythons do well or what city if, are you bending in? I'm in Florida. I'm in Florida. So you can do any city. Yeah. Yeah. It, it'll be interesting to see like if there are like repticons that are like repticons or, or, or whatever. Oh no, they're all they're all ball python. There's a repticon every other weekend here. Like oh. literally, I think there's 33 shows, 33 repticons in Florida per year. That's a lot. So if you take that out of 52 weeks, there's one at least every other week. Somewhere it within yeah, don't the don't do all of those. No, no, absolutely not. <laughs> do not ever. I don't have I don't have a big enough collection to uh go to like every show like that. But yeah. But if you if you don't want to be full time or whatever, you just want to kind of break even on your feeder costs, then like who cares, right? Not not yet. I, I don't think I'm quite there yet in terms of collection size. Of course that would be a dream, but yeah. Right. I just it's like the, the economics of what's happening, it's hard to like impress on people. Because there are definitely like Nick Muttons and Zirkles and like specialist collections that are full time. Yeah. But it, it's, I, I, I fail to see how there's enough market share for everyone who has the aspiration to be the full time. Oh, absolutely. Whatever. Yeah. Boega guy to be the full time Boega guy and not mostly be doing online sales to other specialist keepers because that's who really wants your weird thing right your yeah. weird your parrot snakes <laughs> or your yeah velvet swampy snakes swampy velvet yeah. snakes. you know what i mean like who wants that right. just the one guy he lives across the country so like it's yeah. about knowing your market and doing these shows and be like oh this is where the rubber heats the road where you've actually figured out if it's if it's rare because it's just hasn't been promoted enough or if it's rare because people don't really actually like it. <laughs> actually. Yeah. yeah. It's Not a lot. Sure. Yeah. Um, now just some other stuff I wanted to talk about. Obviously you have a pretty, pretty large sized reptile podcast out there on, on YouTube. I actually put, mm -hmm. uh, I'm pretty sure I put the YouTube link. Oh yes. I, I put it there. If you look in the description it says at whole back rack podcast so uh if you're interested people chat go check that out go click on it go subscribe um talk about that a little bit because obviously you know you've been doing that for quite some time mm -hmm. uh yeah it's been go a long ahead. time isn't that crazy <laughs> i always like why am i still doing this and you're like oh, i'll still do it it's fine yeah <laughs> yeah so like do, wanting to do a podcast is obviously just uh, narcissism, right? Let's be honest. To, to, a little bit. Uh, to a degree. <laughs> For some reason, you feel like you're so special that people out there in the world deserve to hear you. Yeah, you, you know what? Ever. The, thing is, the thing is, I actually don't. So I, I want to, cause I, I think there are some people that are like that, but like, I fully admit where I'm not knowledgeable and I can lack knowledge. My goal is to bring other people here. Cause I tell everyone I learn shit every week. I do not know everything mm -hmm. by any means. I'm still kind of a newbie. I just know some things about colubrids more than your average reptile keeper mm -hmm. for sure. I still, I still think it's a form of narcissism because it, you, it, could be feel like and i you think i want to be the one to talk you know what i mean yeah i'm doing for sure, it, so but I'm not guilty right <laughs> yeah yeah for sure but not everyone uh has yes. the ability or public speaking no well, willingness to do this so right sometimes and so you people... gotta be the one to take that leap right <laughs> yeah i mean a lot of people also just don't have the willingness to do it every week for years yeah on end also because like that's the part that the part that's hard i think anybody could like halfway interview somebody else sometimes it's it's the willingness to do it three years later or whatever but but i don't think people right. who even stopped early really or not early stopped whenever they stopped they're not bad people either all of their content is still valuable contribution to like the the hobby for sure it's more like I think what 
what's the motivation to keep talking? So it could be, you know, teaching people about different kinds of colubrids, introducing them to that species, or I don't know. For some people, it's like just, you know, explaining whatever whatever their belief system is, because none of us are making enough money that it matters. Uh, you know, it's just right. whatever message you're trying to communicate, is there someone there listening and do you still want to communicate it? And so my message was always primarily uh, biosecurity it, in, across species and then like ethical keeping, whatever the fuck that means to people, by the way, because it means something different to everybody. But like, you know, should we be breeding ball pythons that are sub $50 retail? Is that, is that an ethical production? Uh, is that animal treated well in the end? Like questions like that. So I yeah. still think those questions are un, maybe unanswerable, but definitely unanswered now and are still worth grappling with. So that's why I still do it. Wow. You know, there's really no reason why people are still getting ball pythons with nidovirus or, you know, garter snakes with crypto still to this day. But it still happens every day. I get like messages, phone calls. Oh no, yeah. what do I do? Why are all my snakes dying? I'm like, I guess we still need to do a podcast, don't we? Because I think it's still happening all the time. Yeah. It's insane. Yeah. yeah. That's why I do I, it. Why do you do it? Honestly, because like you said, okay, the, the sure, I'll admit the no, narcissism. Because I, I like because I like because I like talking about this every week. Um, plus I get to hear the mindset of different people. I think that's something super cool about the hobby. This gives me a platform to like talk to people like you, like, cause if I mm -hmm. never had this, me and you may have never spoken ever. Mm -hmm. Um, and we may agree on things. We may share ideas, but without me reaching out to you, without me having this platform, we probably may have never like crossed paths besides liking each other's pictures on Instagram for the next mm -hmm. <laughs> however many years right right it is th there is like a water cooler conversation effect that happens on podcasts that can be helpful i think yeah you know f even for the listeners like even if there's no conclusions or information shared you know you're like oh you know people are grappling with the same issues i am yeah. or maybe found solutions to problems that i have yeah. And even like you may not ever think it, but like I think there are times where I where I just hear one little thing in a in a podcast and in an informational thing. And I'm just like, oh, I never thought of that. They may have mm -hmm. not thought it was anything. They were just talking about it. But I took it and I was like, oh, that's really interesting. And you never know when that might happen within your own show. Right. And I, mm -hmm. I feel like that happens sometimes because I've had some people mention to me certain parts of the show and I'm just like. Oh yeah, that yeah, that that did happen. Like yeah, that that was a cool part of the conversation. So, um this has just been I say it every week. It, it's just so much fun and I've really been enjoying just talking to people about this stuff. Plus I love I love these species. So, it's awesome. Mm -hmm. Keep going. Don't give yeah. up until you yeah. want to give up. Then it's fine. No. It's it's not going to happen. <laughs> not uh, anytime soon. A lot of people give up eventually. Yeah. I'd like to not. Okay. I mean, you can. What I'm saying is like people. Hmm, people get like worked up about it in a way like, you know, conflicting times. And they're like, this is what. And then and like there have already been like sets of audiences who have cycled through the podcast and then gone away to do something else. So I've already right. cycled through like three audiences, a co-host. It's yeah. fine. Wow. Very, uh, I'm very way of the water right now with this bitch. <laughs> oh, that sorry. microphone wanted to be. Did you hear that? Yeah. Did you hear that? No, it wasn't I'm that so bad. sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, I, uh, but yeah, no, I, I totally hear like you. Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, and I'm sure this show's gonna grow and evolve over time, and it's gonna be different things. I like right now. Like I've even thought about that. Like we, like right now, it, it's mostly me interviewing a lot of people just based on their collections but i'm sure they're gonna 
there's going to be a time where, you know, I bring back some of my original guests and we have a little bit more of an intellectual conversation Mm -hmm. just about the hobby, about certain species. And it's not this like, it's not really just like a question answer type of thing. It's more of a conversation and, and not that I try to keep it. I try to keep it more conversational rather than like, I'm trying to grill you because I don't want it to ever feel like that. But I also am like, that's why I try to make like, I have questions per guest. Like I go and I do research on their collection and I, there's certain topics I always find that like I want to talk about. Cause I think it's an interesting, engaging conversation that maybe whether you want to hear it or not, maybe, you know, someone in the audience will find it interesting too. And, and I've gotten nothing but positive feedback, which is just, awesome and for those who who even watch or listen silently i mean you're still listening right so Mm -hmm. it's reaching someone out there hit the like button everybody for sure perfect time to hit the like button yeah please do so are you gonna get rid of ball pythons do you think because uh you're more satisfied with colubrids no we we yeah we were talking about it a little bit before the show um which yeah, I don't I don't mind talking about it. I think I'm gonna move some of them out after seeing what happens this breeding season. I think I wanna be a little more project focused and work on things like work on certain projects that I'm really passionate about with the ball pythons because mm-hmm. I've been finding that I'm getting a little bit more enjoyment out of my colubrids and that there's other species I wanna dive into. So I think having a minimal ball python collection where i could work the stuff that i really want to work i could have more room to work with other species i want to work with on the clear side a a number count that you can't go over in your room currently uh we're kind of we're kind of getting at the moment i'm so i still live at home i'm in my parents like my collection Mm -hmm. is in my parents garage Um, that's okay we're all yeah yeah (laughs) <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, my collection is in here. I mean, obviously, once I'm able or do move out into my own place, I mean, I'd like to expand to as, as much as I can go. So, no, I don't have it. Like, right here, yes, there's probably a, a preset number. I probably can't go too much deeper um, on adults mm-hmm. of anything. Yeah, well, and that's but, a perfect uh, reason to, like, shave projects off or whatever yeah uh, yeah exactly and that that's part of it as well my problem is i have a four car garage and i'm like guess i'll just ha- keep more <laughs> Both the thons, let's see and then you're like yeah. why do i have so many how does this happen yeah no but uh yeah so i mean we'll we'll see as time goes because i'm sure like like genuinely there's projects here that i don't want to give up and i think there's stuff like i really want to strive to make on the ball python side so i'm like no i i i i wouldn't want to sell all of them if i was forced to get Are rid you tired of something of investing in ball pythons then um i don't want to spend as much money mm. anymore on certain stuff i i'm very like i see things and i'm like that would be cool but i'm not spending the money i spent two years ago Right, right. That's part of the market's problem is everyone's like, I blew my load at peak pricing, and now I was supposed to be getting paid back now, and now it's peak not pricing, and there's not enough of us buying in at each price point to like support it, and that's why the prices fell. But yeah, it gets like a pain in the ass. Like, oh, I gotta scrape together another three, five, eight thousand again this year for a new mail for this project yeah. and this project and this project. And you're like, Ugh, lame. <laughs> that is why colubrids are nice. But I don't know. I there's a problem of like if you're not investing anymore in bold pythons, sometimes it's like maybe you should already be getting out because like what's the point because you're not keeping up with the market anyway you'll time yourself out of of relevancy within three years anyway so like that i think about a lot no yeah and i i definitely agree with you and i and, and i think about that myself i'm like if i'm not buying now i'm like is that a problem where where the prices are at but some of the stuff i would want to get are still 
priced high. Like what I want to be in is is like puzzle stuff. Like that's what I've made one of my main projects, like Hypo Puzzle. I I've bought a lot of. I actually don't have a single visual puzzle. I have a lot of hats now. Mm-hmm. Um, I should be. I have some pairings going. Hopefully, I hit some puzzles. Maybe I have a chance at Hypo Puzzles. Um, so that's gonna be fun. And and really, what I wanted to do at at this point where i'm at with my collection i want the dust to settle of what i produce this season and then kind of take it from there but you haven't bought your new mail for next year yet no i don't know it's just a feeling i talked to aaron about this a lot uh reptile enterprises aaron maybe too much maybe i talked to him about it too much but it's like what what are the death knells of a ball python collection Stops investing, diversifies, <laughs> diversifies species. Yeah. Because like you're getting tired of it in, in some in some capacity. And me too. I'm here. I'm here, brother. I'm so yeah. Here. Like well, you like, know what? I well I, I, I normally spend three thousand on a new mail each year, but mm, you know, just buy a thousand dollar mail because like it's it's but then you're falling behind. So like I, I Yeah. Know. Yeah. I also don't I I don't want to live I don't think that rat race like I, I, some people can do it, but I don't want to live in that rat race in the reptile hobby for like forever. Like I, I like these animals too much and that's the easiest way to burn out. Look at how many people are getting out of the hobby this year. And don't you think that's probably the number one cause right, of why because is they because they know they can't paycheck. keep up. They bought it in 2020, all of their females are up to size, you know, they should have been laying and hatching in 2023 and they put them on a market that didn't want them. And they're like, get fucked. <laughs> what the fuck? Yeah. Oh, is and this listen, a I totally. Show? I'm so sorry. No, I we can't. Asked. It doesn't right. matter. No, it's all good. It's all good. The um... JJ added that to the audio only version. <laughs> sorry. Um... Go ahead. What? No, it's all good. I was going to say, you know, what you were saying about like, did I buy my next mail? Like, the answer is no. But, um, that's not going to be why like I'm not going to sell out of my book. I'm not going to sell my collection off this year. And it's not because I didn't buy that mail. We're going to see what happens. And I, I may buy something this year. We'll mm-hmm. you still you know, have time. Buy, to buy, like, time I, absolutely. Season. Exactly. Time, time will absolutely tell. Yeah. But, um, it's more like if people are getting that feeling of like restlessness is that, is that, I don't know, but is that the indication that they will get out in two or three years? Cause they're, they're already sort of, waving a red flag in terms of their interest in just going all in on ball python investments because that's sort of what you need to do to to stay relevant and not to say you can't sell them at shows or whatever for forever because you can't right it's just like you know i don't know i just something i think about because i obviously have a lot of ball pythons and i some of them were, were expensive they're not really expensive now but they were at one time and so you're like What do I do with them? Yeah, I like them. They're cool. I like breeding them and taking care of them. But if my heart is not uh, all in, is being sort of just interested in them enough to be a good ball python breeder? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, and I I don't know how much you've heard of me talking um, that. You've heard me say this, but I, I very often say, you know, the the people getting out of the hobby right now are the ones who really didn't give a shit about the animals in the first place. What do, what do you think about that? Mm-hmm. If you got in three years ago and you're, I think there you're are posting your collection for sale. Still in the hobby now who don't give a shit really about animals. Oh, I a thousand percent agree with you. <laughs> I a thousand percent. 1,000, 1 million percent agree with that. And I think they're fake as fuck, and I'm sorry. Um, right, because like, like it might them. be kind of about animals. Like, they kind of might like animals. But, like, so part of the, what's confusing is, like, the, the desire to get extra species indicates to me that you, you like animals. Like, you're yeah. just curious about the natural world in some way. And you're like, oh, I just want to try other species. So, like, is that a death knell or is that, like, a precursor to 
you just being the collection you were meant to be. Like if you could pick perfectly from the beginning all the species that best vibe with your personality and you find the most satisfying. So like that's the question. I don't I don't have any answers, but like watching right. people get out having only ever had ball pythons and then be like, ew. And they don't ever go into a different species and they don't diversify first or they don't they just get out. Yeah, fuck them. They're they whatever. They just wanted right. a, a side business. Okay. But then yeah. the people who are like diversifying to find to to fulfill the curiosity, it might it might not be the death knell for them being a keeper, but it might be the death knell for them being like the most effective ball python collection possible, which is it's a very, you know, you've seen it, you know, it's a very yeah. efficient creature that must be that way because of how debilitatingly fast ball pythons are. Right. <sighs> Is that like a weird thing to say? I don't know. No, I I kind of I I kind of agree with that, and you're right. Um, and, so I and never yeah, had I, ball pythons. I didn't have ball pythons first, so like neither did I. Right. So then I, then I'm like, who am I? Am I like not doing ball pythons correctly because I'm not doing it a hundred percent? And so like which I should is, not which do is what them. I've also thought. <laughs> and so I should not do them because I'm like kind of fucking them up anyway. I, I think there's still ways. It, here's the thing: is I think there's still ways to be neat, like have you know. Again, like my collection's about half and half. Like I think there's still ways for me to be niche and cutting edge with a smaller scale collection. Obviously, it's not going to mm -hmm. be to the scale of that person who only does ball pythons. Correct. But I think you could still you could still make your mark. With a with a smaller, right. more focused ball python collection, it it's a hundred percent. Yeah, I just think you have to pick something real niche, though. Like you got to yeah. beat the. I'm not even sure. Just something. It can't. It almost can't be popular because you won't have enough funds to keep up fast right. enough. <laughs> Does that make any sense? Like, so maybe hypo puzzle shouldn't be it there, buddy. Sorry, I I know you like it, but Ooh, so popular. <laughs> Yeah, but I might make visuals this year. That's the thing. I got I got ahead of that jump. People are buying like hats now. Like I might make visuals this year, and I'm going for like hypo double hat DG puzzles. So, okay, maybe I don't know. And I'll, I don't know. I'm not so, in charge. Yes, yeah, no. I hobbies. yeah. <laughs> I I get you. No, but I I totally I totally hear what you're saying. Yeah, I think a lot of people who are like mixed species collection people who happen to have ball pythons are in almost the worst position possible. The ball python people think you're stupid and the, the everything else people think you're stupid for having ball pythons still. And you're like, yeah, well, there's like these like redeeming qualities of ball pythons. You know, they, they're very weird. They have interesting biology. They don't lay very many eggs, so they can't like flood, flood their own market if we weren't breeding so many to begin with. Like, and that's a problem right. with lots of colubrids is that you could like, Whoops, a daisy. I made 70. <laughs> Whoops. And you didn't yeah. really want 70. And they double all of them double clutched. You're like, I I can't actually sell this many babies. Or like viper geckos do that. There's a lot of species that'll that can, that you can flood on accident. Right. Ball pythons don't do that. That's why they stuck around so long. Because they have, you know, small clutches and all this diversity and blah, blah, blah. So there's lots of interesting things about them, but then because it's not your only priority, you're you're almost never fast enough, never efficient enough, and people act like you're a, a monster <laughs> at a at a at a at a fucking dinner table at, at, after the show. You're like, this is a vendor dinner, and they're like, ew, and you're like, fuck. I just, yeah, I just need to start like some multi-species keeper, uh, but to still has ball pythons like you know, AA group or something. <laughs> Let's go through the 10 steps of grieving. <laughs> no, but you know what? I, you don't I think, belong anywhere, really. Same. Yeah, but I, you know what? I always say, like, I've been riding this horse that, you know, diversity is key. I, I think that's the way to have the most fun in the hobby, like on your mm -hmm. own, within your own collection, because you get to see so many different things. Mm -hmm. Um 
Two, you, you learn uh, going off of that. You learn so many things because each species, each individual within that species, you're going to notice different behaviors. And I think it's fun to observe that. Like that's that's part of what people even do this for. And and you know they they keep stuff just to observe behavior and they experiment with different things, whether it's their actual caging and environment and whatnot. So I, I think it's very cool you know, within the few species that I have to be able to observe all these different behaviors, like it makes it more fun for me. And mm -hmm. honestly, what I care about is me having fun and enjoying this. And also, That's obviously good. I'd like to make, I'd like to make a couple bucks doing it, but I fucking love reptiles. So mm -hmm. end of the day, that's it. And that's how it should be for most people, even though it's not. Mm -mm. But it's hard to blame people because like, if something has like an, let me air quote this one investment price tag. It becomes an investment. So they're right. expecting a return. And that's true across species, by the way, if something starts to have a $500 and up price tag, people start expecting things, uh, you know? So yeah. I don't know. It, none of it really matters. All this is like navel gazing or whatever, but I think it's all, it's all okay. You know, if people want want to be something or don't want to be something, what I would like those is for people to just a, appreciate anything not a ball python at a show. That would be dope. But it but that's it's, that's what I say too. Really it's like to work. Yeah, yeah. No, I I think it's um like I think it's cool. Like I find it interesting when I see that off the wall species at a show. Is like you know like I I we were talking about it earlier. Like when I got to go see. April's table in Orlando, just getting to see house snakes. It's like, you don't, you don't see house snakes at, at shows. Mm -hmm. It's like, where, where are you seeing that other than someone like April's table? Um, no one's seeing Texas rat snakes except my table at a Florida show. It doesn't happen, but I've made some pretty cool babies this past year and people have expressed interest. Like I even brought, I brought uh, one of my cocci for display, the, the bamboo, and people were like, that's the coolest thing I've seen here all day. And even just getting that recognition, I wasn't selling the animal. I just brought mm -hmm. it because I was like, let's bring an attention grabber. Let's see what it does. And the amount of people that stopped at my table just to point out that animal to me and be like, oh, my God, that did something for me in my head. I'm like, OK, I could see this. Mm -hmm. And people are people recognize that, you know, these are a thing. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hopefully things are different. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't I don't know how to fix anything. Uh yeah. But a lot of times what happens is if you have something rare on your table, they'll stop if they know what it is and be like, oh, that's rare. But then they that sometimes can slow them down and they'll buy something cheaper and more common, like a corn snake or king snake or whatever right. ball python on your table. So like it can work as like marketing at the show even if it's not that species that's moving it could be like part of the process yeah so like it i don't want people not to have diverse collections but i always want people to be like clear about the financial side of it like of course you know yeah. it's the common pet cool the pet stuff is is your bread and butter and the the cool stuff is you're like you're waiting for that niche buyer to walk in and be like I know what a cocci is of course I'd want one yeah or whatever right. yeah hundred percent yeah but I think I think that's why it's important and plus like I don't want to say the number is infinite but like think about the percentage of the U S population that actually keeps reptiles like we're going to see new people come into the hobby every single year on all different levels, whether it's the investment breeder level, the pet level, everything. So yeah. having the diversity of all these species, in my opinion, is important for fostering that next generation for passing these along. Cause one way or another, you are right. While they might be niche, someone's going to want it down the line because someone's mm -hmm. going to do their research. Someone's going to stumble upon it. Right. We don't want to lose where... species in the hobby. Exactly. <laughs> Please don't. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. It's just like a lot of times in, in my head, shows are for John Q public. And so you can educate them a little bit, but a lot of them, 
they can't even handle like do i need a thermostat or not right that part is like blowing right. their fucking mind so like since they their cousin had a ball python they understand that or their cousin had a king snake they understand that that's what they're there to get and so like it's the it's doing podcasts or whatever about a, a species a niche species doing youtube videos tiktok videos like hey this is what a dion's rat snake looks like or whatever then they're like oh i have a ball python it's actually kind of boring or whatever now i can go get a dion's rat snake or and and so it's it, it, you'll figure it out the more you vent, you'll just be like oh yeah i can buy leaves at home yeah <laughs> we don't need to give them mites this time right <laughs> just no it. yeah for sure Black uh, shows. sorry <laughs> said that out loud <laughs> it's all good it's all good. Well, um, awesome. So th this has been a great conversation. I kind of want to get into a couple of my wrap up questions. So uh, what does the future kind of hold for Hair Hollow Farm? Do you have any plans, any any species ads? Like what do you what do you foresee the next three to five years looking like within your collection and what you're doing with reptiles? Uh. I, I really want a compound, right? And not for child brides, right? That would be like an obvious <laughs> choice, but not for that reason. I, like, so ideally, I don't know, we'd hit some sort of like uh, financial boon one of these years. I don't know, you know, like you've sold enough stuff. You have enough like inertia with a number of breeding animals in your collection, have a good wholesale outlet for like the low end stuff, which is always a burden <laughs> getting them yeah. nailed down and then literally get a compound. I'm talking like a temperate calibrate room, the Japanese archipelago building, the boa building, ball python building, the North American calibrate room, the Montane North America. I don't know. That's would be like perfect situation, maximum money made. Go back right. to having like land and like multiple buildings is what I'm sort okay. of getting at. Okay. Because I used to have cool. five acres. Now I live in town. Oh, wow. It's real lame. Okay. <laughs> okay. And where exactly are you? I'm sorry. Now I'm in uh, Altus, Oklahoma. And I don't want to stay okay. in a state all either because it's not very fun here. Uh, okay. <laughs> I would like to move a another time. All right. One last time. Yeah. That would be perfect okay. situation. Yeah. Gotcha. Waco Exotics. <laughs> No, I mean there'll be some guns, but but we I, we don't need to defend the the compound against uh, ATF, you know. <laughs> yeah, it'll just be a bunch of bunch of buildings with snakes in it and geckos right. and whatever. Because exactly. like that's always the trouble. It's like I want more species, and I'm like, mm, these ones are too cool for my room, so they need to go in the house. Now they're in the office. How many species can I fit in my office? Oopsie, uh, too many. And then right. Because, like, as far as, like, management, I can keep taking care of this many animals. It's just, like, can they fit in the systems I have? Yep. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Is that a dumb goal, to have a compound? No. <laughs> it, no, 100%. It's not. Um, okay. I mean, that's, that's like, what, uh, like, Tiki's geckos, I, I don't know if you're familiar with mm -hmm. them they're down here in florida they're they're actually probably about 40 minutes to an hour north of me like they just have property and they have you know those mini like sheds yeah. there on their property to divide oh i did it again to divide their rooms um right you know they have like a i've actually become I be, and yeah like, i've become your room yeah yeah i've become so friends with that, them actually like, they do the scale. local shows yeah, right? exactly. Exactly. Keep going. Keep going with that. Because, like, I would love to run colubrids, a lot of the North American stuff, temp, uh, you know, ambient only. Yeah. Because it's easier, frankly. So easy. It's because here it's hot. So I'm, like, cooling the room down, but running heat panels for, you know, the, the tropical stuff. And I'm, like, but then I have to cool it down more if I keep the Jap rats in there. It's, like, it's all, like, a thing now. It's, like, a thing, and it's kind of bullshit. And I'll be, like taking the bamboo rats and putting them on the ground in bins during the yeah. summer. Cause I can't get the building cold enough. It's, it's ass. Fuck that. 
multiple buildings with multiple yeah. environmental parameters. That's my dream. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's a great goal. You should uh, do your best to strive towards that. That's awesome. <laughs> I, will. I need to like, uh, I don't know, sell my body on the streets or something. I don't know. Cause right <laughs> now these shows are like letting me down every time we just like break even or whatever. So yeah, hopefully just, everybody come to Dallas and buy some steaks for me. I'll be at Dallas and ARPC next weekend. So cool. yeah, steaks and all kinds of other cool shit. Yeah. I don't even think awesome. I'm bringing ball pythons. I don't know. Come buy some corn steaks and we'll start working on this compound. Maybe I'll make you like sister wife number five or whatever. If you're lucky, <laughs> if you buy enough corn steaks. <laughs> oh, all sorry. Right. That was weird. I got it. I made it weird at the end. Sorry. <laughs> It's all good. It's all good. All right. Awesome. So my last kind of question before we wrap up, um, I always kind of ask, so circling back to Colubrids. So what would you say to someone who's looking to get into Colubrids, whether it's their first animal or whether it's like a Python or boa keeper, who's like looking to make that conversion, what's kind of your elevator pitch for Colubrids? Hmm. Gosh, I mean, most, not all of them, but a lot of colubrids are just just straight up easier in general, like, especially North American or Asian stuff, like temperature parameters, they yeah. don't give a fuck. <laughs> Some of them might need a hot much. that they barely don't give a fuck about, that they barely yeah. use. Even the stuff that's warm doesn't really want it. Yeah. Um, a lot of them are like easy eaters. Like I can drop feed 200 baby corn snakes in 20 minutes. Try to tease feed frozen thaw to ball pythons. 200 of those. Uh, no, I don't fucking think so. <laughs> I literally, no, my, my feeding routine, I get live rats on one day for the ball pythons. And, and I don't, obviously I don't like show live feedings. Like I think that's dumb, but like, I like I do live for the ball pythons. That's easiest. That's just, whatever out of sight out of mind it's fine Mm -hmm. frozen thawed for all my colubrids absolutely no problem whatsoever it's just like they're so easy so it's so simple thawing is the most complicated part about it right and you know those little like food service two ounce containers i use the two ounce cup part for their water but i take the lid and i make like a little plate (laughs) and so i plate up pinkies and i was like la 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 this is so easy (laughs) whatever yeah. and i'll come back through and i'll double check but it's like in terms of like ease of management speed and ease of breeding a lot of them breed really fast and breed really well yeah um they're they're not they're not as complicated and and everything's so fast when they breed it's not like ball pythons it's like okay we're gonna start breeding and maybe next year or the year like after maybe, that. Maybe maybe we'll six to eight to months later, you'll have eggs. <laughs> maybe. Or maybe not. Maybe. Or maybe they'll reabsorb. just reabsorb. Reabsorb after five months. And then you're like, well, I guess I'll wait till next right. year. So a lot of the temperate colubrids are on this like time scale. They're like, okay, it's warm time. I'm gonna do everything as fast as possible. And so they're yeah. like, come up from brewmate. And people are like, brewmating is so hard. It's not really. That's like the best part. You're like, bye. Half of the collection goes yeah. away. See you later. Yep. Don't give a yep. fuck. And, and exactly. you do wellness checks. But like that's a great part about keeping yeah. colubrids is you get a break. There's a built-in break. You get a break. Um, Big so time. like there's a lot of reasons why they fit in with a ball python collection too. Like I usually brewmate when my most of my ball python females are eating the most food. Like I'm feeding them the most. So like my rodent supply has like the best chance to produce the best ball pythons because you can like right. sync it up so there's so many like management ways that like colubrids fit really well with a ball python collection it's just like maybe your ball python room is too hot frankly like the ambient for most colubrids unless you just want to run your whole room 82 and have no hot spot for yeah north american stuff that and you just figure out which one of those you like um yeah. I, but, but the thing that I think most ball python 
breeders don't like about colubrids is they just think they're all too small as babies. Every single one, no matter what it is, they're like, it's too yeah. small. And I'm like, I don't know how, how to help you. <laughs> they just are right. small when they're born. <laughs> they Because a baby ball python is born huge relative to its adult size. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. That's all. all right. I just hope people do. Fuck it. I don't know. Just do it. Because yeah. I said so. All that. <laughs> And awesome. also keep boas. Boas are way better than ball pythons in general, period. Also. So, yeah. yeah. They're, They're definitely cool. Cooler. I have not I have nothing against them. I just uh I don't have the want to fill that size capacity, like their housing, mm -hmm. like caging. I just uh it's not something I'm interested in filling a whole room with big big cages or whatever yeah so i i like smaller stuff that's just me what if you had dwarf bows maybe and had them in like 90 series subs maybe maybe we'll get you on it because <clears throat> they're like everything All you right. like about ball by bones but just better <laughs> like slow yeah. metabolism yeah that's true but the prices are more stable because they don't breed as fast morph stacking or locality or and selective breeding. It's like a perfect species. Just saying. Just yeah. Let's put that up there. <laughs> awesome. No, all species are beautiful. Uh, don't fire fire me or cancel me, please. God. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, That's on that funny. note, well, on that note, uh, Jessica, we had at least thirty people here because there's twenty nine likes, but there's only fifteen people here. So people came in and out all through the. <laughs> almost two hours we've been talking. So it's been a fantastic conversation with you again. Thank you so much for coming on. What do you have to say to everyone who is here to uh, check out this conversation tonight? Thanks for coming out. Uh, you can see me on the whole back rec podcast. I talk about whatever I want to talk about every week. Sometimes it's clue yep. Sometimes it's not. Um, and then maybe better follow me on Instagram. It's mostly like, it's just my yeah. collection, but it's mostly I have, clubbers. I have the link to Jessica's Instagram in the description. So you guys can go click on that and give her a follow. But uh, yeah, thank you so much, Jessica. Uh, I will run the outro uh, and just hang out for a couple minutes and we'll talk after okay. the show's over. All right. Thank Bye, you. Bye, everybody. All right. Well, guys, thank you so much for tuning in to episode number 21 of the Kluber Corruption podcast. I hope you guys all enjoyed. I think that was a really cool episode. I think we had some good conversations. Uh, I just think, you know, especially someone like Jessica, like I, I think she just likes being open, upfront, and honest about everything, which I like about reptile people because I think some people just like like to bullshit and beat around the bush a bit. Um, so I think it's always cool to have like a, a good, genuine conversation. And I hope you guys all enjoyed what we talked about tonight. Leave a comment down below what you thought. Um, and if you like today's podcast, make sure you leave a like. Make sure you hit subscribe on our channel. You could tune in every single week for uh, new Kaluber Corruption. We do this every Sunday at 7.30 p.m. EST. All my social media links are down below. Feel free to give me a follow on Instagram. That is where I am most active. Uh, get me to 1500 followers. I'm almost there. So close. What am I at? I'm still at 1486 guys. Get me there ASAP. Uh, also get me to a thousand sub subscribers real quick. Cause that'll be cool too. Other than that, uh, meteoric serpents t-shirts are available. I do have animals on um, morph market. Um, I hope you guys all have a great weekend or a great night. It's almost the week. But yeah, guys, this has been episode number 21 of the Colubrid Corruption Podcast with Jessica of Hair Hollow Farm. Hope you all enjoyed. Have a great night. Peace out, everyone. Thanks.